Today we're going to talk about plyometrics. So plyometrics is a type of exercise that we've talked about a little bit uh, a little earlier in the semester, uh, but it's a really productive and important type of exercise. Here you see a video of Rachel, who is an alum of our program for, for a few years ago. You've actually seen videos of her before using her lower body to absorb forces. Now you're going to see a video of her using her lower body to store and return forces in this here. And that's called a box jump or a drop jump. So plyometric exercise is characterized by a rapid eccentric muscle activation followed immediately by explosive energy return. Uh, which is also called the stretch shorten cycle. So we start with an eccentric component where the energy is being absorbed. Amortization is where we can see no kinematic event, but some really interesting and important things are happening within the muscles and the tissues as they go from the lengthening energy storage phase uh, to the shortening energy return phase. Uh, and then uh, all plyometric exercises are characterized by a counter movement activity. So in the video that we were watching of Rachel a minute ago, she landed uh, the lower body joints flex, the lower body muscles uh, activate eccentrically, the connected tissues like the tendons are lengthening a little bit, storing the energy, and then the counter movement activity is at jump upward. Uh, and this is possible because of the mass spring characteristics of limb control. We've talked about this before. And one of the important things to remember about that is that the greater the deformation, that is the more the joint flex, the greater the potential energy return. That energy return that we were describing is a product of both the viscoelastic properties of connective tissue. Remember, uh, one of the characteristics of a viscoelastic uh, material is that the faster you load it, the stiffer it becomes against deformation. And the, neuro, the neuromuscular pattern of mass spring characteristic of limb control. And for this reason, muscle recruitment intensity during maximal plyometric exercise is able to exceed that of maximal voluntary connection. So why should we do plyometric exercises anyway? Uh, one is for the sake of muscle fiber adaptation. We've talked about this uh, several times over the course of the semester. Uh, that rapid eccentric contraction is, on the one hand, the most potentially damaging to muscle cells, but the upside of that is also it is the best at stimulating adaptive changes because it is the type of muscle uh, activation that requires the most adaptation. In addition to the tissue changes that accompany plyometric training, uh, there's also neuromuscular learning, motor learning that takes place. Uh, one of the really important things in most sports is the ability to change direction. Consider, for example, a uh, running back in football who is dodging a tackle. The maneuver is called cutting, and it's when one or both feet uh, plant into the ground, and then the individual rapidly changes direction. Uh, so plyometric training uh, allows an individual to improve in that neuromuscular skill. Uh, so that they can do two things. They can take full advantage of the energy return for the mass, from the mass spring characteristics of limb control, uh, and they can align their lower extremities dynamically in such a way that it will help prevent injury uh, while doing those uh, activities. So how should we progress exercise? Well, first, it's probably helpful to start with no velocity and have patients or people whom are using exercise to train just hold positions statically. That way the co-contraction helps the patients learn the correct alignment. Uh, and then once they show that they can hold the position statically, 
uh, then to progress to a slow speed, then finally a high speed. High speed is the most challenging so far as both neuromuscular control uh, and um, to the tissues, as we've talked about several times, because that high velocity eccentric contraction is causing the highest muscular tenderness tension. Uh, and then uh, once we start the high velocity training, uh, we start with single planar or the most simple types of uh, patterns and exercise. So as an example of single planar, a person might be hopping front to back or left to right, but not both at the same time. Uh, once they've mastered that uh, single planar type of motion uh, while maintaining really good alignment, uh, and control, then they can progress to the next level, which is doing it by planner. In that case, perhaps uh, starting with uh, jumping front to back and then alternating that with side to side. Uh, and then finally progressing to a triplanar variation, which it would include perhaps a vertical dimension. Now, um, hopefully you'll get to meet uh, Mark Colson in the next few weeks. Uh, but what he would say is do not progress a patient to the next level until they absolutely own the previous level. Uh, and also, I, it is really helpful to, when we progress the complexity of the movement, perhaps to decrease velocity. So, for example, a patient may be doing the biplanar hopping uh, very effectively, uh, but then when we progress that patient to the triplanar uh, motion, we might want to start at slow speed and then progress to high speed. So remember these two variables uh, when you're prescribing the level of exercise, that velocity and complexity of motion. Uh, and when you increase complexity, you might want to decrease velocity to allow the patient to learn it effectively. In addition to velocity uh, and complexity of movement, another variable which we can manipulate is load. Uh, so uh, in rehabilitation, we would perhaps want to start with unloaded exercise because sometimes even body weight loaded exercise uh, is too much for a particular injured joint or tissue. So what we see in this picture on the upper right uh, is deep water running with flotation devices. That way we can get to very vigorous cardiovascular and muscular exercise. Uh, in fact, because there's no energy return, but with very low, uh, both compressive loads on the joint and tensile loads on the muscles. We could advance that to include an external load, such as you see with the two athletes on the bottom left of the slide. As we have been talking about over the past few weeks in this class, uh, we can manipulate the effects of surface depending upon what we want. So for example, a hard energy returning surface decreases the demand of kinematic control, but it increases the demand on the muscles and tendons because of the velocity of eccentric muscle contraction that we have uh, with energy returning surfaces. Uh, so hard surface, easier for kinematic control if that's a problem, but harder uh, for muscle tendon injuries because of the high muscular tendon muscular tension. Uh, we can exercise on a damping surface uh, for a couple of reasons, either because we want to decrease the muscular tendon load, and we've talked about that a bit over the course of the semester, or we want to increase the demand on kinematic control. Mm -hmm. Remember that the athlete or the person who is undergoing plyometric training should not progress to the next level until they can completely own the previous level. Uh, and the sequence uh, that we should pursue includes first the strength phase, and strength is slow speed movement, uh, followed by what is sometimes called the plyo support phase. In the plyo support phase, if somebody is learning a hopping or jumping exercise, 
what that person does is land and freeze in position. That freezing in position helps them learn uh, what the alignment should be like by encouraging co-contraction of the muscles to help hold that correct position. Then finally, the performance phase, which includes the uh, the stretch phase, the amortization phase, and then the shorten phase, which is the explosive energy. So if somebody is beginning plyometric training, especially for the lower body, and most frequently it's done for the lower body, although it may be done for the trunk or upper body as well, uh, they will start with a squat or some variation with it. Uh, and we recommend that they start with the simplest variation uh, a symmetrical type of squat, uh, maintaining uh, coplanar femur, tibia, and calcaneus, uh, such as you see with the picture of the fellow here. Uh, and they would do that statically to help them learn the correct alignment. Uh, and then they could progress to a staggered type of squat, aka a lunge, uh, which is, so far as neuromuscular planning, a little bit more challenging because of the asymmetrical uh, aspect of that. Uh, that again, the patients should start static to make sure that they can maintain alignment and balance during the exercise. Uh, and then they could progress to a unilateral squat. Uh, so here we see a woman doing that over on the picture on the left center. Uh, and the reason that that's harder than the other variations is in addition to having to really concentrate on the sagittal plane alignment, uh, a person doing this also has frontal plane challenges. Once they are able to do each of the exercises statically, uh, then they can progress to do them dynamically, but in slow speeds. Once the patient is able to demonstrate good control and balance and slow speed, then we can progress to high speed landing strategy. So the landing strategy that we're describing is landing from a hop or a jump and then freezing. That is that they're maintaining the position with flexion of the hips, knees, and ankles uh, such that they've just absorbed the force of the landing. Uh, that freezing allows them to maintain co-contraction of the muscles, which is an early phase of motor learning. So in that way, we're facilitating their learning of correct alignment and balance. Uh, but what happens to the heat is instead of the energy being dissipated as the elastic recoil, uh, it is dissipated as heat. So a lot of heating up happens with this phase of the exercise. Once a patient is doing the plyometric exercise, uh, we can progress it. So first, uh, we can have the patient uh, maintain or ensure that they maintain alignment and balance with unexpected demands. So for example, with the woman who is doing the lateral hop, instead of just allowing her to do it laterally, we might command left, then backwards, then left again, then right, then backwards, etc. Uh, so the directional uh, hop is unplanned. Uh, or we could her, have her do a ball toss uh, while she's doing this hopping exercise. Since the objective of plyometric exercises, especially for the lower body, is help, helping to develop uh, quick movements and quick change in direction. Uh, when the patients are practicing the jump patterns, uh, we encourage them to think of their body as an inverted funnel. That is that their head and upper body are remaining in the same position uh, and their feet moving underneath them. Uh, so that if we were to look at it in multiple exposures, it would look like a funnel. This allows a way quicker reaction time because then the patient is not moving his or her entire center of mass. The next slide has some pretty detailed information about recommended dosage uh, in plyometric training. Uh, so I'll just let you read this and think about it if you're working with patients 
uh, or athletes uh, whom you're helping with conditioning with this type of exercise, one thing that I think uh, that is worthwhile for me to point out uh, is that the having adequate rest uh, in between the sessions appears to be really, really important for recovery. And recovery is really necessary for adaptation, which is what we're trying to cause. There are a few ways that you can adjust the dosage of plyometric exercise. A previous slide described number of foot contacts, but also you can do dose through intensity. In this slide, we consider the intensity of the plyometric exercise is measured by how much deformation uh, it is caused in the limb segments, usually the lower extremity, although it can be the upper extremity as well. Uh, so if the exercise is causing a greater amount of deformation, it's also causing greater intensity. And therefore, you'd expect for heavier, heavier people with greater body mass, uh, even if they don't have any external resistance, uh, to be experiencing more intensity doing the same exercise compared to a lighter person. It is possible to increase the intensity of plyometric exercises to the point where a single repetition would count for many foot contacts. Uh, this um, hyperlink that I've included in this slide, I'm unable to open, so I have sent you guys uh, all the link on email. So just go ahead and look at it for that example. With this slide, I would just like to pose a question for you that we're going to have as one of our discussion questions. So I would like for you to think about the question posed here uh, in this slide. This slide here, we have a lot of detail about how to control dosage uh, and as is the case with strength training, um, you want to do the strength training regularly, but you don't need to train to the maximal level uh, with every single time. So usually uh, when doing training, uh, you want to choose the level of training that is going to give you the best uh, and safest outcome. Uh, so this in this slide, we just describe uh, some of the ways that you can manipulate intensity uh, through either um, uh, target times, seeking a proportion of target times of repeated like plyometrics such as agility drills, or decreasing the maximal effort by decreasing the vertical component or the external load uh, that is being applied. Here we have uh, just a couple more discussion questions that we'll assign and think about for next week. Regarding a study, this is one of your reading assignments uh, from uh, these Italian researchers uh, published in 2007. Okay, so these are the things that we have thought about over the uh, past half hour or so that we've been discussing this. And I'm looking forward to talking to you and discussing some questions and hearing your ideas about 